Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer in just a moment. I just want to remind you, we don't come to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, from the older, from the young. Let's come into this place to hear from God. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit in just a moment to be our teacher. So as I get down on my knees and I ask the Lord to speak to us, I'm going to ask if you're able, would you join me and let's stand together and let's prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord today. Father, we just come before you, Lord. We're just so grateful and blessed to have the opportunity to come into the house of God. Lord, we don't take that for granted, Lord, that we can come and freely worship you for out, without fear of, of persecution when, when millions around the world are, are heavily persecuted just to mention the name of Jesus. And here we are today. And Lord, we thank you for that. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or from a woman, from the older, from the young. Lord, we don't come to church for tradition or for, for entertainment, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the senior leader of this house. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your precious Holy Spirit would be our teacher, would be our counselor, would be our guidance today. Show us the word of God as you would have us to read it and and learn it today, Uh, that it would be like a seed planted into good ground, the seed being the word, the ground being our hearts and our lives as we walk out of this place, Lord, that we would bear much fruit for the kingdom of of God and for the glory of God. Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. We don't ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for all our brothers and sisters around the world and the Inland Empire this morning that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptist and Lutheran and Methodist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for all the denominational brothers and sisters. God, we thank you for our uh, Pentecostal and charismatic brothers and sisters, our local churches in the area, churches like the Harvest and, and the Grove, and, and, and Lord, churches like Sandals and, and the Well and the Way. Lord, we lift up uh, Emmanuel Baptist and Victory and, and Crossroads and New Creation. Lord, all the churches, too many to, to mention today, but Lord, we thank you that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, and we're serving your kingdom for your purpose. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, on this week of elections, we just ask that you would bless this country. Lord, we ask that you would open up doors of opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be spoken and preached in this great nation of ours and around the world. Father, we thank you that you would lead us and guide us as how to voice our uh, given right to vote. Lord, we thank you that you would just place individuals that need to be placed. Lord, open up doors uh, for the gospel of Jesus to be spread around this place. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon our government and our country in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, there's many of us in this place that are faithful to the cause of serving and following after you. And Lord, we thank you for blessing this great nation of ours. Bless this church. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to take my jacket off on this one. Thanks, my friend. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 35 is where we're going to pick up today. Hebrews chapter 10, going line upon line, precept upon precept. The title, if you're taking notes or for for sake of reference, the title of this morning's message is Longevity for the Long Term. Now that's kind of like a double descriptive. That's kind of saying like, I'm in it in the long term for the long term. And I thought long and hard about that. and, And I wanted to put it that way because, you know, God's desire for us his people, his church, is to be in this life, in this relationship, in this thing that we would call Christianity for the long term. It's not a game. It's not a trial. It's not a, well, let me test this out, see how this works. So you and I have got to have this long-term commitment to follow after and to stay after the things of God. And last week, as Pastor Dan was talking out of Hebrews, the 10th chapter in the 35th verse, we're going to look at verse number 35 again. And we're also going to look at verse number 36 and just pull some simple but important truths out of the Word of God for you and I to apply in, in, in longevity for the long term and staying in this for the long haul and staying consistent and committed to God, not just in the trials of life, but in the ups and the downs, in the ins and the outs, through all aspects of life, staying consistent in our relationship with God so that we can do and we can be exactly who God has called us to be. So here in Hebrews in the 10th chapter... We see uh, in verse number 35, where we're going to read today, starts off by saying, therefore. Now, you and I, we've been taught here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center that whenever you see the word therefore, we always say it like this, it's there for a reason. You can describe it like this, uh, or if you were to use another word, you could say something like consequently. Consequently, because of what was just said, now I'm saying this. 
Now, in order to understand what we're looking at here in the, verse, in the 35th verse, we've got to look at the concept or the idea and the context of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. And if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, we were really getting into uh, some very difficult uh, scriptures or passages of scriptures when it comes to Christianity because it's talking about those who are drawing away or who are pulling back. And, and the Bible speaks a very strong message to those who have come and who have joined into the body of Christ, who have experienced the presence of God, who have, who have tasted and seen and then have pulled back and, and, and the, the consequences thereof. And we saw this in Hebrews in the 10th chapter. We saw this warning once before in Hebrews in the 6th chapter talking about that as well. And so it's a very serious, a very sombering, a very sobering message for us to realize that once we get into this, this isn't a tryout. This isn't a let me test it out and see how it is. This is God's desires. Hey, man, once you're in, you're in. And so because of that, now the authors of Hebrews says, because of what I've just said, consequently, now this is important for you and, under, you and I to understand. And he says, therefore, consequently, do not cast away, do not throw away, do not get rid of or give away your confidence, which has great reward. Now, Pastor Dan talked about that last week, talking about our works, our confidence in, in God. And, and we talked about this as well in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Confidence can also be said as the word boldness. We saw that boldness and confidence can oftentimes be mistaken as arrogance or conceit. But let's not, let's not get uh, off the, the topic. It is not arrogance. It is not conceit. He is not saying don't toss away your arrogance or your conceit. He's saying don't toss away your foundation, your root, your confidence, that which you have, your expectation of something to happen. Don't toss it away which it has great reward. In verse number 36, in lieu of what we've just read, I want to include this into what we're talking about today because the author of Hebrews says this now. He says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And he goes on and he begins to quote out of the Old Testament that there will be a time when the Lord will no longer tarry or no longer wait and He will come. And now so you and I have a responsibility to do some things, to, to, to keep on or hold on to our confidence, to, to keep on to our endurance and to hold on. And so I want to talk about a consistency in our relationship with God and in, in, in our walk with God. You see, I had heard a statement one time a long, a long time ago from a pastor, Pastor Andy Stanley on the other side of the United States. He said this statement. It was really intriguing to me, and I think it's just so true. He says, we live in a world that baits us to the edge and then mocks us when we fall over. And that's so true. If I could say it like this, we live in a highly hypocritical world. A world that says, hey, listen, I'm, you need to stand for something. You need to have a reason and you need to have a cause and, 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 and stick to your ground and, and we support you and everybody has a freedom to say something as long as it's what I agree with. And if it's not, I'll persecute you, I won't like you, I'll exclude you. I'll, I'll. And, and so we live in this world that says do what you need to do, but only do it as long as it fits in. The problem is, is the world that we live in is not just high, highly hypocritical, but this word hypocrite, which literally, when you look back into the definition of, of the Greek word hypocrite, literally comes from the, uh, from, from the actor, uh, the, the person who was an actor on the stage. It's, they were playing a role. They were playing somebody who they were not. And as, as the, the, the drama or the play was over, they would remove the mask and be who they really were. And a hypocrite, as you and I would know, is defined as somebody who says something but does something else. The problem that we have is that this word hypocrite is often synonymous with the word Christian. And it should never be that the word hypocrite or hypocrisy should ever be in the same sentence, the same thought process, the same category as the term church or Christianity. Now, let's, let's just let's get honest. Let's be truthful for a moment. We've all said things that we've Regret it. We've all done things that we knew we shouldn't have done. You know, just a few weeks ago, I was on the phone with a, uh, with a friend of mine, and, and, and he asked me a question, and I said something that I should not have said. And I texted him back and says, man, I'm so sorry. I should not have said that to you. We've all made mistakes. We've all said things, and we've all... The reason is, is that while we walk according to the Spirit, we still have this flesh body. So I'm not speaking to, oh, well, somebody said something, and, 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 and they didn't quite follow up, or they made a mistake. But in terms of hypocrisy... When we look at the long term of our life, when we look at the course of our life, we should always strive to say that when somebody looks upon us, looks back at us and says, man, they were never inconsistent with what they said. They were never somebody who said something and did something else, but rather they followed through 
with what they did. You see, God's desire, God's plan, God's purpose for us, his church, is to be consistent, to be in this for the long term, for the long haul, to hold on to the longevity of the word of God so that we can be who God has called us to be. So this morning, looking out of those two verses out of the book of Hebrews, I want to just take a couple simple truths that you and I can apply into our lives so that we can remain consistent for the long term. So we're going to look at Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 35, look at some of these, these, these things. They're, they're rather obvious right in front of us, but I just want to talk about staying consistent for the long term. The first thought for this morning in staying consistent in the long term is that we have got to keep our confidence in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. You see how I have it on the screen in, in, in all capitals? Because it's so easy for us to put our confidence in everything else around us. We learned that in 2008 that we can't put our confidence in the stock market or the real estate market. Many of you in this place, your retirement or your, your, your savings plan or whatever it might have been, you had maybe had some confidence there. Well, this is, it's always going up, 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 up. Well, we found out that we can't put our confidence in that. We can't put our confidence in those around us because we've seen over time that people will eventually let us down. Our confidence must not be in anything else but Christ. Amen. Let me ask you this question. You just participate with me. Entertain me for a minute. How many of you have ever been on an airplane? Wow, you guys are a bunch of flying people. All right. Can I ask you a question? When you, when you got on that airplane, when you went on that trip, did you go up to the ticket counter and say to them, can I see the credentials of the pilot flying the plane? Can you, can you tell me what he's done? How long has he been with the company? Where was he before he was with your company? Where did he learn to fly? Did he learn to fly in the military? Did he learn to fly on his own? What happened? Can, can, can I see the maintenance record and log of this airplane? I want to make sure that every little... Can, can, can you show that? Didn't you? No. You know what you did? You waited in line. They called your boarding tier and you ran on that plane as fast as you could to get on that little tiny squeezed in seat so that you could get your arm rest before somebody else. Right? That's what you did. Some of you say, you know, Pastor, like, I've never flown on an airplane before. Okay, let, let me bring it home. I, I, with the exception of the four ushers that I see standing right now, everybody else in this room is sit sitting. Did you, when you walked into this room, Look at that green chair that you're sitting in right now and kind of come over to it and shake the seat and look at, make sure that the armrest and kind of hold the back. Is it going to hold me up? No. You know what you did? You came in and you sat down. Why? Because you have a confidence that the airline pilot is qualified to do his job. You have a confidence that the airline is taking care of that airplane so that you would get from point A to point B. And your life is literally in their hands. You have a confidence that the Rock Church and World Outreach Center has a staff of, of members or of employees that watch the chairs to make sure they work. So it's so easy for us to put our confidence into other things. We never even think about, well, this, this, this guy flying the airplane has my life in his hands. But yet we easily surrender it off. But when it comes time to, when, when rubber beats the road, when it comes time to, to put our confidence in Christ, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not quite sure about, you know, my business. I'm not quite sure about my children. I'm not quite sure about my finances. I'd rather put my confidence in what the Harvest Business Journal says, or I'd rather put my confidence about my kids into to what, what the doctors say, or I'd rather put my, my confidence in, in this over... And, and, and you see, we got to understand that it's not about everything around us. Our confidence is in Christ. Our confidence is in Christ. <laughs> Going back to Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 35. Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 35 says, Therefore, do not cast away, throw away your confidence because it has great reward. Our confidence in Jesus Christ is the foundation for our lives. I'm going to say a very important statement. I hope you get this. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our life, not the stepping stone. I believe I heard that from Tony Cook, so I'll give him the credit for that. But Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our life, not the stepping stone. You see, a stepping stone is a something that you stand on, that you get a firm grip on, or you get a, your balance on. And when you get there, once you've established your balance, then you move forward to the next. Oftentimes, we come into this, into this relationship. We come into church and we say, God, I need help. God, I'm a wreck. I need you to fix me. 
and we give our lives to Christ and we, we look to Jesus and all of a sudden something begins to change. And then when something begins to change and things get better, we start looking to the future and to what we can step to the next. Well, now that I'm good, let me go over here. Now that my life has been, now that my children are successful, let me step to here. And you see, Jesus Christ is not like a stair on the staircase of life that we, that we stand on in order to elevate ourselves. Jesus is the cornerstone. You see, a cornerstone was the biggest rock or the, 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 the most solid stone in a foundation laid in the corner of a building. It was chiseled to exact specifications and upon that stone, everything else was laid or everything else was measured by. So Jesus literally is the foundation for which everything in our lives is built on rather than a, a, a platform for us to become better in life. That means our confidence is in Christ. Are you guys with me today? Paul, the apostle in Philippians in the fourth chapter, he says, it's a very familiar verse. You, many of us know this, Philippians in the fourth chapter, verse number 13. Paul, the apostle, says these words. He says, I can do all things because I am the man. I can do all things because I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews. I can do all things because I was taught by the best teacher. I can do all things because I'm a Roman citizen. Paul the Apostle tells us this, right? In case you didn't know. No. It's on the screen. <laughs> Paul the Apostle, who just got done telling us, I, I, I could brag. I could tell you I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews. I was, I was raised in the best of schools. I've got the citizenship. I, I mean, I, I've, got a, I've got the resume that you need. He says, it's not about that. I count that as waste. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, everything that he built his life upon was upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, not the stepping stone. Therefore, you and I, in order to be consistent through the long term of our lives, our confidence must always be in Jesus Christ. Amen? So we're talking about staying consistent for the long term. Always keeping our confidence in Christ. Secondly, don't give up when results aren't apparent. Don't give up when results aren't apparent. You see, results are mandatory in salvation. It's quiet. Let me, let me, let me. Here's why. There's this book that we follow called the Bible. You with me? In the Bible, we read about Jesus who died for our sins. But you see, the Bible tells us that Jesus, on the third day, rose again. Right? The power of God. You see, so now the power of God that resurrected Jesus now lives and dwells in us. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but now Christ who lives in me. So therefore, if God is a God of power... Jesus is, 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 is the, 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 the avenue of which that comes. When we come into Jesus, therefore, we have power in our lives. And if we have power in our lives, that produces something in us. So there are results to follow salvation. But they may not always be apparent. But let me, let me explain this to you. Just because it's not apparent doesn't mean it's not present. Let me, let me, let me, let me paint a picture for you. You take a seed and you put it in the dirt. You put water on the dirt, and results will begin to happen. Although they may not be apparent, they are present there. Why? They are below the level of the dirt. That seed is breaking open. The, the, the plant is breaking through the dirt, and it is making its way to ground level. And eventually, the results will become apparent as that seed breaks through the level of ground. So here in Hebrews in the 10th chapter, verse number 36, it says, For you have need of endurance. We have got to learn to stay, to commit, to hold on, even if results may not be apparent at the moment, they are present in our life through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we're to bring this home. I bet you each and every one of us in this room can think of one person by name that has come, that has been in the house of God, that has been in, in the presence of God, that has followed Christ, and they did not see what they were hoping for. They did not get the results that they were expecting, and they gave up. So here, 
The exhortation to you and I is to have endurance, to hold on to what God has said, to hold on to the promises of God, to, to maintain your endurance in life. All too often, Christianity is, is, is equated to or is treated as a sprint. When it's a sprint race, the gun goes off and everybody runs at full power as fast as they can for as long as they can, whether it's a, a short distance or a, or a moderately longer distance. But you see, Christianity is not a sprint. It is more like a marathon. Why? Because we are in it for the long haul. You know, you look at a marathon. If you watch the start of a marathon, they do not start the marathon off sprinting. But I'm not saying to start your walk with God off slow. Because they also don't start walking. They start at a consistent and steady pace because they know that there is a beginning, there is a middle, and there is an end. And each one of them has its own challenges. And we have got to learn to pace ourselves. And all too often we come into this as a sprint. Man, you come to church. God, I need help. God, I need help. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm ready. Pastor counts, claps his hands. Woo! That's me. I'm ready. It's like a flash in the pan. And all of a sudden you see those people and you've seen people like that in, in a, a month or a week or, or a year later. They're back to exactly where they were because they did not see the results that they were hoping for. But look what it says in the book of Galatians in the 6th chapter. Galatians in the 6th chapter, oh, such, a, such an encouraging verse. Galatians in the 6th chapter, verse number 9 says, Let us not grow weary while sitting in church. Let us not grow weary while listening to the pastor preach. No, let us not grow weary while doing good, while putting something to work, while sowing the seed. Why? Because he says, for in due season, you will reap. How? If you don't lose We've seen in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a season, there's a time for laughing and there's a time for crying. There's a time for sowing and there's a time for reaping. And so when results may not be apparent in our life, but if we've got the power of Jesus Christ on the inside of us, they are present in our lives. And you may be sowing and somebody may be reaping. But take heart that somebody will sow and that you will reap. Paul says, man, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was Christ who gave the increase. That we have got to learn to hold on, even though we may not see what's going on, that God is able, capable, and faithful, and we will be consistent in the long term. We're talking about staying consistent in the long term. Third and final thought for this morning First was to keep our confidence in Christ. Secondly was to not give up. Third one is to keep pressing forward in action. In action. See how it's in all caps? In action. I love how the Bible equates Christianity to a race. It's brilliant. Why? Because the worst thing somebody running a race can do is go backwards. Think about it. They can stop and take a break. They can fall down and not move forward. But if they go backwards, they're literally doubling their effort. I, I have my sister-in-law started running half marathons. And as she was running these half marathons, you know, I could say without having her up here and having her tell the, the story, I could say without a shadow of doubt, it would be inconceivable for her to start running her race. And as she's got her pace going, to just kind of... I'm going to go this way instead. And start running back the way she came. And then she sees everybody's running the other way. Oh, 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 no, okay. Um. Because when you're running a long distance like that, you want to get from point A to point B as soon as you can. By going backwards, you're literally adding to the labor of your race. The worst thing somebody could do in a race is go backwards. And so to equate Christianity as a race is saying the worst thing you and I could do to, to our life, to our relationship, to those around us is to be inconsistent by going backwards in the race that God has called us to go forwards for. 
And so as she goes in this, this half marathon, she knows, she looks at the map and she knows the direction where she's supposed to go. She knows what area is the uphill, what area is the downhill. She knows where they're going to hand out water, where they'll hand out the energy gel. She knows where her family and her friends should be to root her on. Why? So that she would continue to put one foot in front of the other foot, 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 and keep going and going and going and going and going and going so that she finishes her race. If we want to stay consistent for the long term, we have got to remember to put one foot in front of the other. In action, start doing something. Look what it says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 36. You have need of endurance so that after, so that after, so that after, so that after, after, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Works and salvation go hand in hand. Oftentimes we get afraid or, or churches kind of, I don't know if I want to talk about works. Why? Because humans, we're like, we're like water. We seek the path of least resistance. So you start talking about works and it's easier to do good than it is to live a living sacrifice. So we say, well, I'll do more good in my life and that will make me good with God. But we know, we heard this last week with Pastor Dan, we know that we are not saved by our works. We are saved through Jesus Christ. I like this. I've already used his name once in the reference. I'll just throw him out there again. Tony Cook says this wonderful quote. He's the, he's the king of quotes. Works are not the root of our salvation. They are the fruit of it. Works are not the root of our salvation. They are the fruit of our salvation. So you see, we are required, we are responsible through the power of Jesus Christ in operation in us to have works, to have fruit, to put one foot in front of the next foot. Listen, it may not be a big step that you take, but at least it's a step. Moving forward in the right direction, one foot in front of the next, over and over and over and over again. You know, I remember I had heard a celebrity talking about his faith one time, and he was saying, and he made this statement, it's really intriguing to me. He says, you know, I have a quiet faith. My faith is a quiet faith. And I thought, man, that's, that's a real interesting statement. You know, that's great for you. If you want a self-help message, a quiet faith is, is just great. It's wonderful. But what about the people that you love? that need what you have? What about the people that you know that need what you have? What about the people that you don't know, but you see that they need what you have? You see, a quiet faith is great for you. A quiet faith is great for me personally. But you see, our faith is not a quiet faith. That's why the Bible tells us that the, the Word of God was confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Word of God is backed by the power of God. We don't, we're not just a book on a shelf that we follow and hope, like Mike Keith said on Wednesday, that we hope we've picked the right one. Our faith, our gospel is a gospel of power backed by the power of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is loud, it is active, and it is involved in our lives. So we must live a life that works. Oh, that's a play on words right about there, isn't it? Life works, right? Jesus comes, gives us life that works, but then we, never mind. <laughs> After you have done the will of God. Philippians, we were there in fourth chapter, Philippians in the third chapter. Paul the Apostle says this, he says, I press towards the goal for the upward call. I press towards the goal. I looked up that word press in the Greek, the original word. Literally means to run for your life. Not just to run, to run for your life. I remember when I was in high school, I tried out for the football team. I didn't make it. And I remember I had to run the 40-yard dash. And my, my sister's friend at the time, who was a football player, says, listen, listen, let me give you a little bit of advice. He says, when it comes time to run the 40-yard dash and they're timing you, don't just run. He says, imagine the scariest person that you know chasing you and then run. <laughs> to run for your life. You know that you run in such a way that you are going to finish the race. You think of it like this. In, in the football, in the NFL, to press towards that prize. Those, those, those two teams in their skin-tight pants and shirts and, and helmets and those 400-pound uh, guys of just 
testosterone and muscle. When the quarterback puts that, that football into action, they press. They push against each other. They fight. They're, they're pushing forward. And each one of them is hoping to get past the opposition in front of them to get to their end destination. Paul the Apostle says, I press. I push. I'm, I'm striving for. I'm running. But not, I'm not just going just gonna, to, okay, well, I'll run. I'm going to run like I'm running for my life towards the goal. Because that is what God has called me to do. And you might be in a, in a position of your life to say, Pastor Luke, you know, I've run my race. I've come to the position in my life where I've seen the fruit or, you know, and, and, and it's not, you know, what it is, what I did years ago, I, I, I'm just not capable of doing. Understand that in every area of a race, there are different seasons and there are different levels. There are those who are starting, that there are those who are running uphill, there are those who are running downhill, those, are, those who are coming towards the finish line. And you may not be able to do what you did in the beginning when you started because of your life or because of what's going on, but you can still do something by putting one foot in front of the next, one foot in front of the next, one foot in front of the next. To press towards that goal. Christianity is certainly about works. Let's not be mistaken about that. In conclusion, what it boils down to is this. Longevity. Longevity. What it all comes down to is that one word. Longevity. Longevity says I'll stick to my commitment even if it hurts. And at the end of my life, I will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Longevity says that at the end of my life, when people reflect upon what I have done and what I have said, even if they don't agree or they did not like me, they will say that I was consistent and held to my beliefs. That's God's desire for us. To be consistent and to hold on so that we cannot be or we can go beyond being a hypocrite in a hypocritical world. But we are consistent in who we are. Pastor Jim or, uh, has always taught us this and all my life I've heard this is that commitment without consistency is no commitment at all. Commitment without consistency is no commitment at all. And I want to conclude with this. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew Go with me to the book of Matthew in the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Verse number 3 will start. They come and they ask him. And now he sat at the Mount of Olives. In verse number 3 of Matthew chapter 24. Now as he sat at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus answered to them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. These are all the beginning of sorrows. Then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of the lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That sounds a lot like the world that you and I live in in this day and age. But listen to the very next statement that Jesus says to his disciples. In verse number 13, he says, But he who endures, but he who endures, he who endures till the end shall be saved. He who endures. Guys, this is not a tryout. This is not a trial period. Jesus says, man, you're in this. You are in this till the end. So I want to encourage you to stay with it, to stick with it. And I love what he says at the end of that, in verse number 14, and he says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Who is going to preach the gospel in those times? Those who endure. Those who endure. You say, Pastor Luke, you're talking about works. You're talking about doing something with your life. Pastor Luke, I don't know what to do. 
I don't know what my calling is. Like soldiers in an army, we all have a specialized mission. We all have a specialized calling in our lives. But just like soldiers in an army, even though we all might have a specialized mission, that way you can't look at somebody and say, man, I need to do what they're doing because that's what God has called them to do. We all have a common goal, a common commitment. And one thing that we all share, and that is to go into the world and tell them about Jesus. To go to the world. The world may be across the oceans or the world might be across the street. It might even be across the cubicle or the desk, wherever it might be. But we all have one common commission to tell the world about Jesus. You may have no clue what your calling is to do, but you can start by being faithful to the commission that God has brought you into. And today I want to conclude with this thought. There may be some of you in this place today, you come in here and you feel like you're at the end of your rope. You feel like, man, I'm on the verge of giving up. Let me share with you this. Don't give up. Don't give up up. Don't give up. Keep your confidence in Jesus Christ. Keep your confidence in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something, that those who do not lose heart will reap. Don't give up today. God is for you and with you and you can and will endure and receive the promise after you have done the will of God. Amen? (laughs) Praise God. Before we leave, I just want to do one more quick thing. I'm going to ask, please, just remain seated. Don't get up. Don't leave. Don't walk around. Give me a moment more of your attention. Very, very, very important. I'm going to ask you a question. The question is this. If you were to leave today and you were to die, heaven forbid that's the case, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? You see, it's a travesty that we would get together and worship God and talk about running the race and not giving up and not give you the chance to examine whether or not you've even really started this race or not. So I want to ask you that question. Examine your heart. Examine your life. You see, nobody knows that answer except you and God. So let's go over what you might say. You know, what makes you so sure you're going to get into heaven? You know, you might say, well, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope so. I want to. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you think, because you hope, or because you want to? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you have the most positive outlook on life that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get get into heaven because you're you're the most positive person. It It doesn't work that way. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you as a child that you were a Christian? Because you were baptized or christened as a baby or you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school classes or catechism classes? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your godparents made a commitment for you when you weren't cognizant enough to make your own that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get into into heaven that way. You're not going to find it in the Word of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, you've got a gold star attendance at church, that you're going to get into heaven. You won't find in the Word of God that because you volunteer because you're involved, because you help in the children's or the ushers or the sing in the choir, whatever it might be that you're going to get into heaven. You can't find in the Bible that you're going to get to heaven because of those things. Oftentimes we think, well, you know, I'm a good person. I don't don't do bad things. I I try to help out my fellow human. Doesn't, Doesn't that mean, you know, good people go to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can get into heaven because of your good deeds, because you're a good person? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because God's standard for entrance into heaven is perfection. But the problem is, the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Which means each and every one of us, by nature of our birth, have fallen short of of entrance into heaven. We can't make it on our own. So it's not about how good we are, not about how good we appear to be, or not about how positive we, we think of, or not about our attendance record at church, or even our involvement. There's more to that. You see, you can't get to heaven your way. can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way, and that is through Jesus. Jesus says this in John 14, chapter, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So today, let's not do this any other way but God's. Jesus, in the book of John, in the third chapter, is having a discussion with a religious man, a leader. The Bible tells us that this man, his name was Nicodemus, was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. That tells us that he was a man of influence, a man of position, a man who studied the Word of God, a man who did the right things, a man who, who said the right things. And, and Jesus, as he's discussing the subject of eternal life, says to this man, you would think he would pat him on the back, but rather he says this. He says, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. Now listen, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. It's not about what Hollywood or popular culture, or even what you might think about that word born again. It's always meant the same thing in the heart of God. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me show it to you. 
The Bible tells us in the book of James that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yet they're not on their way to heaven. It's not about your carnal knowledge or mental assent of who Jesus is. You already know who Jesus is. That's why you're here. I can say it like this. I know who the President of the United States is, but I do not know him. There's a difference between knowing who Jesus is and knowing him. And Jesus says these words in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. He says these words, speaking to the church, people like you and I, he says, listen, I'm coming back. He says, and when I come back, I'd rather find you hot or I'd rather find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, he goes on, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean to be lukewarm as a Christian? Let's describe that. Let's define that so that we're clear on that. Lukewarm simply means this. It means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down in your, in your relationship. You're on the roller coaster of your relationship, up and down. You've got your ins and your outs. Lukewarm means that you're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. Lukewarm means that you're doing some of your thing and some of God's thing. Lukewarm means that you've got one foot in the church, one foot in the world. You're doing your own thing, riding the fence. Let me love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough. And more importantly, honor God enough to tell you the truth that you're not going to get to heaven based on your outward appearance. You're not going to get to heaven based on your hopes, your wishes, or your desires. You're not going to get to heaven based on the thought that you're okay with God. God, forgive us in the American church for watering that message down, being more interested in the number of people that sit in our chairs than rather than telling them the truth. But today, I'll tell you the truth. You and I can only get to heaven through God's way, Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And today, I want to offer to you the gift of salvation. The Bible tells us that it's the gift of God is eternal, of, of salvation is eternal life. And today I want to offer to you the gift. It is a free will choice. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. It's your choice. He loved you enough to give you the, the free will to choose to accept or to reject the gift of salvation. It's your choice through Jesus Christ. And as we've said today that Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him today. I want to give you the opportunity to do it God's way. And Jesus says these words. He says that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his father. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. And here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud, just like that. I'm going to go bang. And when I do, if that's you, I want to... I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you to do something. I'm going to challenge you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're just saying, hey, Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. Pastor Luke, today I want to, I want to make sure. Pastor Luke, today I want, to, I want to get saved. I want to give Jesus my heart, my life. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I, I'm not quite sure I can do that. I feel like that, that's really embarrassing. I don't know if I can do that. Listen, let me encourage you. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? Because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church. Let me present to you another challenge. You say, well, you know, I just don't know if I can do that. I, I, you know, I don't know about that. If you can't go forward for God in the church, what makes you think that when you leave this building that you can do it there? It starts one foot in front of the next. And today is a day for you to start your race. You've had dentist appointments and doctor and DMV appointments. Today is a divine appointment between you and God. It's not about the person in front of you, or behind you, next to you, whatever it might be. It's right now between you and God. And in just a moment when I count to three, if that's you, I want you to pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand if you've never given your heart? You've never given your life to Jesus. If that's you, in just a moment, pop your hand up. If you're not sure, maybe you did this at a, at a harvest crusade or in the youth group or something like that, but you've never really followed through with it, if that's you, in just a moment, make this the day that you ensure your place with God. You, maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Maybe you've been running the race and you gave up. And you've been, been running backwards. Hey, listen, this is the day to stop running from God and start running to God. This is your moment. This is your time. It's time for us to get a right understanding of who God is. God's not this, this kid on, in, on an anthill with a magnifying glass trying to burn us up. He's not in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to whack you over the head for the things that you've done. God loved you so much, he gave Jesus Christ to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross for you and me for our sin and for our shame. And in return, he wants our heart. He wants our life. Today, I want to offer to you that opportunity. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want you to pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward. From there, we'll start taking steps together from that moment forward. All across this auditorium, I'm going to count. If you're watching at home on live stream, you can participate too, wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three if that's you. And those of you guys in the family rooms, 
I'm talking to you as well, in the, in the foyer, out in the campus, hear the sound of my voice. This is your moment. This is your time. It's time to get right. Time to start running your race. So I'm going to count to three. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three. I see that four. All right, my man, you can sit down. I see you. Five, six. I see that hand right there. Seven. I see that hand right over there. Seven wise people. Anybody over here? I see people point. Eight. I see you back over there, my man. Eight wise people. Say, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, you should. It's your time. It's your, this is your moment. I see ushers pointing over there. Eight wise people. Nine, I see you in the family room. All right. Anybody else in this place today? Nine wise people. Just three people over there. Ten, eleven. All right. Eleven wise people. Well, praise God. Hallelujah for eleven wise people. All right. Now it's time to line up. And get ready to start your race. You don't get saved by raising your hand and say, man, I want to do this. Now it's time to follow through. You've made the commitment. You've made the decision. Now it's time to make the commitment. It's your choice, your call. So here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand. If you raise your hand, if you're in the family room, listen, the ushers, they'll come and help you gather your stuff. you got your hands full, I know. If you're in the front row, the back row, wherever you're at, if that's you in this place, you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't, but you should have. In a moment, we're all going to stand as we do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get in the aisle, and come meet me right here at the altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. Come on, let's all stand. Nobody leave at this time. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, this is your moment. This is your time. Come on, meet me up here. Just as you are. Oh, and here the Spirit. God, you guys came. Hey, I want to share something with you. Listen, you're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. It's okay to smile. You're going you're gonna to be born again. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets. You made it through me, all right? He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the leader or the Lord and Savior of your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information, some real easy literature to read. When you go home to help read through that, to point you in the right direction, you're going to run your race. You've got to know which way to run. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. Come hang out with us. Come early to church. We'll buy you a cup of coffee right over there in our cafe. You'll sit with somebody, a friend. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks to get you strong. Like a personal trainer at the gym, we call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you, come alongside of you, help you get strong in the ways of God so that you run the race that God has set before you and that you go the long haul in your relationship with God. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Right on. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent Him for me, and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.